Today we have the great pleasure of having Erica Dorn and Sasha, sorry, um, Mumbarts. Okay, cool. I always sometimes, you know, when you, you don't actually have to say somebody's name out loud until you do, and then you're like, oh no, how do I say this? Um, and this is part of our monthly lecture series, and today they'll be talking about community-built futures. Erica Dorn comes from a background of, she's a PhD candidate in tran uh, transition design at Carnegie Mellon, and Sasha comes from a background working at uh, numerous different com uh, companies, some you may know, such as Google, um, and now the two of them work together on this project, imagining how products and services fit within the larger community. Um, one of the projects that I found most interesting in doing a little bit of research was the Good Work Institute, which aims to pay attention to the implications of the way that our economy has prioritized profit above anything else. And so how do you create new products and services responsibly um, that imagine the impact on the future uh, and on the communities uh, that they affect? Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to let them talk a little bit more about their work. And if you have any questions, we'll have Q&A at the end for a little while. Um, and so save them for then. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Wow, this is so loud. Um, take this in my hand. Uh, hi, it's so nice to be here and have all of you here. Hello. Um, hey, hey. Um, so, um, I'm actually, who here is a student at SVA? I'm just curious to see what's in the, who's in the audience. Ooh, okay, lots. Excellent. Is anybody building a community, community builder? Hands up, yeah, a couple, okay, cool, very nice. And is anybody working on or thinking about building a product that's community related? Oh, okay, some other people, that's great, okay, very nice. Um, I'm going to start with this one really interesting fact, or this research, uh, by lady Susan Pinker. Um, she uh, found out that social integration and close relationships are the single most powerful thing that keep us alive longer, more so than quitting smoking. It's pretty incredible. She wrote this book called The Village Effect. So uh, we're going to talk about community. Uh, and what I mean when I say community is uh, how we relate to ourselves and each other in deep, meaningful, and constructive ways. I'm not talking about this. If you can see, it says, join our Facebook community. <laughs> it's a bag of salad. Uh, so, you know, a Facebook page with coupon codes and a bunch of people there doesn't necessarily make it into a strong, powerful community. Um, so there's lots of challenges around community, systemic ones. And I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey <coughs> through the system. And I'm going to start with a walking tour that I used to give uh, through Soho. And Jane Jacobs uh, was a huge inspiration. She was um, an activist and the mother of modern day urban planning. She was also, uh, she fought Robert Moses. He wanted to build this highway through Soho and destroy much of the beautiful cast iron buildings we have in Soho. And she luckily won, so thanks to her, she preserved a, a big part of Soho. And she, in her book, writes that the ideal city is diverse, dense, and creates many opportunities for interaction. So cities are hubs of uh, economic activity and information exchange. They provide opportunities uh, for growth and for change, our own individual change, but also our collective growth and change. So a city like New York that makes up our ur urban environment is an incredibly complex system with buildings, streets, transportation hubs, government branches, rules, regulations, and many, many people that all have a mind of their own. The city mimics a, like our own biological organisms, like organs, that have their own distinct functions, unique properties, but also needs. And the fascinating part is that they communicate and work together in an incredibly efficient, but also autonomous way, 
all in the service of the greater good. So it's, they are incredibly complex, but at the same time, they are self-sustaining. The two key words here are autonomous and self-sustaining. So over millions of years, evolution has created this system that is clearly defined rules and parameters, but also allows for a degree, degree of flexibility and chaos. The individual pieces in this system are autonomous because they fulfill their duties without being individually instructed. You know, the brain doesn't control every cell, and yet they all work in unison. And these complex systems can be found in many places, ant colonies, beehives, human settlements. But the reason that humans uh, went to the moon rather than bees or ants is our ability to collaborate flexibly on a large scale. And the main tool that helped us do that were stories. Stories that we could believe in, share and follow. They could unite us, organize us or help us strive towards a greater goal. And if you've heard some of these ideas, at least I got them from Yuval Harari's two books, they're really great. If you, I highly recommend reading them. So unlike our biological systems, our urban, social, and economic systems don't work so flawlessly. And we've also added an additional challenge. We've moved from settlements and cities to a globalized world with complex economic and informational structures that are fueled by the ever-increasing drive for growth and speed. And thanks to shipping containers, financial tools, and the internet and a bunch of other things, these structures transcend all boundaries. And with that, the network of people that we live, work with, and relate to are getting bigger, more diverse, and more interdependent. But at the same time, we feel more isolated, more different, and it seems harder for our ideas and stories to converge. We've gotten so far ahead of ourselves in trying to scale and automate everything that we've lost trust in and ownership of the systems we've created. We blindly trust so many systems that we hardly understand and dangerously we often think we actually do. So the question is, how do we navigate this heightened complexity? How can we establish common ground within our diversity and among our differences? Uh, what does an equitable and sustainable system that also leaves room for autonomy, urgency and creativity look like? So two developments I think are really interesting here are open source and the blockchain. They're accessible, they're decentralized, they're permissionless, um, and uh, they allow us to interact and collaborate in new ways, right? They enable a form of co-creation and trust uh, and generosity that everyone can participate in, but also benefit from. Still, we've put ourselves in a pretty tricky situation we can't really solve it alone because we're so interconnected. And we have enough experts. I also think we probably don't need people on stages, but what we really need is, um, is each other. And a better language and more words to communicate with each other and new structures and processes that benefit ourselves but also our collective ecosystem. So the reason I'm talking about all this stuff is because I authored this thing called the Community Canvas. And it's a framework for building communities. We also call it a guidebook uh, because we wanted to help people on their journey of starting, growing, and sustaining their communities. And the Canvas has three sections, identity, experience, structure. And for me, they map to belonging, trust, and resilience. And within those three sections, uh, there's a number of themes or conversations that you can consider while you're building a community. I say consider because we wanted to build in some flexibility so that you could pick the ones that are most relevant for you, your community, and the stage you're at. The community canvas is like freely downloadable. Yeah, you don't need to take pictures of it. There's, it's like it's a 60-page PDF, so you can get a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> so let me briefly talk about belonging, trust, and resilience. So belonging is, is threefold. You belong to it, it belongs to you, and you have a longing for it. It's kind of nice linguistically too. Uh, Peter Block came up with this. He wrote a book called The Structure of Community. 
And so you belong to it because you've shared values and beliefs and you identify with, some, with the same stories and places. It belongs to you because you've co-created it, you've put yourself into it through your contributions, your time, energy, and your sweat and blood. And you have a longing for it because it satisfies your needs. It gives you something you want or need. And it's also a frame of reference. Belonging is the space that we operate in. Trust, on the other hand, is built through shared experiences, which help us to get to know each other, build empathy and intimacy, they allow us to live out and reinforce our values and beliefs and make them real. Trust is about managing the unknown. It's about keeping commitments. Trust signifies the strength of our relationships with each other. And resilience is the most tedious part, uh, but it's equally important because when things go sideways, this is what saves the day. It's about the agreements we make how we resolve conflict and how finances are managed, how power is distributed. It ensures a healthy community that's not just sustainable, but also generative. It's the glue that holds everything together. So the canvas, you know, is, we've tried to put a bunch of these ideas in there, but it, ultimately the canvas is really a very small piece of this puzzle or challenge that we're facing. And what we really need more of for a community built future is the right amount of rules and structures with enough freedom and flexibility that help direct us but don't hold us back. It should give us more opportunities for real and honest and meaningful experiences that allow us to relate to each other and collaborate with each other. It provides us with more spaces and places that bring us together online and offline virtually and physically, conceptually and practically where we can listen, share, encourage, discuss, and change all together. And this is where we, that includes you, really come in. Because we as designers, creators, and, and entrepreneurs can create this language and these new systems. I'm going to talk about a couple of okay, uh, things that I've been thinking about, like dating apps. Um, you know. Have dating apps really brought us closer together? I'm highly skeptical, you know. Dating apps are really more of a dopamine trap. Dopamine being the neurotransmitter for rewards. And dopamine feels really good. But, you know, is it really easier to meet people through a dating app? I don't know. I think it might have actually made it harder because uh, people are engaging less because they feel like, or they're engaging less on the street because they feel like they can fall back on the app at home. Airbnb is also an interesting one. It started out as a really strong community. You know, both hosts and guests felt a lot of gratitude for and appreciation for each other's presence. I was an Airbnb host for seven years. I made lots of friends. I'm still in touch with some of them. But um, over time, it kind of changed from a generous community to more of a transactional one and became much more about a convenient place to sleep or a way to make a buck off of the couch that you have in your living room. Couch serving, on the other hand, has always been and I think over time has become a much stronger community. Even more so because there's no money involved, right? It's people are just, it's purely generous because people just host you for free. Um, and, you know, Couchsurfing had to do a lot of things to make sure this works, right? They had to put a lot of system rules, values, and ways to resolve conflict in place, into place to make sure that everything would work out. I mean, doesn't always work out. Erica will be talking about those challenges in a bit too. Um, and they're a big part of that. Another interesting example is Peloton, that stationary bike um, where you can compete with each other, but they also have taped sessions. They have a very strong Facebook presence. Facebook is a very contentious topic generally, you know, but it's an interesting example. They have 500,000 people in their Facebook group. And um, this lady here, who's, I think it says she's 64, or she posted something, 180 people, so I can't really read it, responded, you know, in, in encouraging ways. Uh, 17, like 1,700 people liked the, the post. So, you know, it's incredible to see how many people 
on there, encourage each other, and share their stories, their success stories. I've heard st other stories of people meeting up in real life and becoming friends, so it's actually kind of amazing how this very virtual thing becomes real and d does something in people's lives. It changes them it, and also does something collectively. And you know, it's something that the bike did, the app did, but also the people who are working there, the community managers who've created this entire system and product. But I want to make one note about this. Um, a lot of companies use the word community, but in fact, you know, they're talking about their customers. And it's a very transactional relationship. They're trying to use network, network effects and viral, viral loops to sell their product. So it's not really a community in that sense. I feel like it's, like I said in the beginning, m very much a buzzword that people use very frivolously. Um, and to that effect, you know, I f think I, I don't really want to talk about communities as wrong or bad. I usually look at the, think about them on a spectrum between weak and strong, right? A strong community connects people in ways that energize them, lifts them up, supports them, and can even give them purpose. Versus a weak community is more transactional than, ra than generous, has infrequent points of contact, sometimes events feel like they're communities, but they happen so rarely, it's very hard to actually build a strong community. Or they have very unclear internal and external purposes. So there's obviously lots of criteria and it's very nuanced and difficult to assess that. So I'm just giving you a couple of general pointers here. To sum it up, you know, as, as everything grows and becomes more interconnected and complex, we need to really focus on what's close to us. Rather than extending ourselves and trying to s solve all the problems everywhere, working on a non-human scale <coughs> that we often hardly understand, we'll be much better off if we can, if each of us is building strong and meaningful relationships or encourages the forming of these relationships with the people around us. To form small but powerful ecosystems that energize and inspire us to be proactive and generous and then that can emanate outwards to the rest of the world. And that's the end of my part. Ta-da! <laughs>